This model beat ChatGPT 3.5. Hey, this model beat GPT-4. This is the kind of news that we hear almost every single day with every single new LLM. And a lot of times we have this skepticism in our mind. Is it possibly because there is a benchmark data leak or data contamination? And this was a big issue when Fi launched. And at this point, probably you should pause this video and go to my Fi video, which I link it in the YouTube description or somewhere in the top. So that is exactly why I wanted to cover this new paper, which almost brought me a lot of joy and smile on my face that this paper is called Do Not Make Your LLM an Evaluation Benchmark Cheater. So basically they're saying is, do not use evaluation data or benchmark data as part of your LLM creation process. The paper does not uh, get into a lot of details about um, you know how to avoid this in future. They have some um, valid points. But the reason I wanted to cover this paper is primarily to bring visibility to this concept of benchmark contamination or data contamination. The paper is called Don't Make Your LLM an Evaluation Benchmark Cheater. So this is uh, uh, from uh, Renmin University of China and also Illinois University of Illinois. And probably this image itself is like really good for you to understand what is happening. Typically, a large language model needs pre-training data and you have got pre-training data. And uh, when you train the model with just normal data, you would see like a rank 10, rank 11, rank 12 on particular benchmark performance. Now, when this data has got a little bit of benchmark data in the training and test and that is exactly why you would start seeing like an amazing rank improvement the model is like the benchmark beater standing at the top of the hugging face leaderboard or something and this is the problem with current llms that are being developed because what this paper is addressing is that a lot of existing data sets have got benchmark data set contamination and uh, also this paper gets into some kind of information about how you should avoid it if you are either LLM creator or also benchmark uh, data set management. The most important thing, if you have never heard about this, this is something that I always keep in my mind. Even when I make YouTube videos, this is something that is always in my mind that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. Like I make YouTube videos because I like to teach. Of course, I like a lot of views. I like a lot of subscribers. But if I make videos only saying that, okay, I want this video to make 10,000 views, next video to make 12,000 views, that measure ceases to be a good measure. It's a measure, it's a metric of how my videos are doing. It should be a reactive metric of how I did and then based on that, it should be a reflection. It shouldn't be a metric that I'm trying to optimize it. The same way, when a measure becomes a target, when a measure that is like a metric used to measure becomes a target, which is almost like every single corporate company makes this mistake, it ceases to be a good measure. This is called good hearts law something that I keep it very closely to me in everything that I do in my life. And that is exactly what is happening in the LLM world. You've got a lot of benchmarks like MMLU, Big Bench, AGI Evil, Human Evil, and you've got all these benchmarks. And what started happening is that there started, uh, these benchmarks are actually data sets. For example, uh, if you say MMLU, it would probably have like a 25, 30 questions or a set of questions. Now, when those set of questions start leaking into the pre-training data, because of course people build pre-training data by scraping the internet, then that is exactly where the problem starts folding in. So for this evaluation, for this understanding, these um, the researchers of this particular paper, they used the LAMA models, they used GPT-NEO model, they used 5 1.5, open LAMA, LAMA 2. So if you have not seen my 5 1.5 video, I would strongly encourage you to go watch it because there was a lot of skepticism and Fi as well. And I link the Fi video in the YouTube description or also somewhere in the top. Now, at this point, you can see that when this, um, this language model does not have any data leakage. So this is like data leakage of training set. This is data leakage of uh, testing set. So you can see train, there are three sections, train S, test P, test P and S, denotes the data leakage scenarios, training set, the test prompt and both test set and the test prompt during training. So that is what the last one is. So if you see here, when there is no training data leakage, you would see that uh, it scored 24.04 on MMLU. But once you start leaking the data, the ultimatum is like, you have got all the training set plus the test uh, prompts, then it is 36.15. So you would see like a massive jump almost like a 15% yeah 15 50% 24 12 50% jump in the mmlu benchmark just because the data has been leaked there's been a benchmark data contamination 
and the same with phi you would see like from 42 it score goes up to 46.8 uh, same with open lab a 3 billion parameter model from 26.49 to 48.31 in fact you would not see a huge uh, jump in phi because a lot of speculations have already pointed out that phi might already have the data contamination when they built the base model in itself and you would see a similar setup with llama 2 and this is something that you would see across benchmarks mmlu bull q um, hellaswag wg arc so you would see all these things and what they are doing in this paper is they are also going across multiple other benchmarks and then actually proving the same point saying that okay once you have the data contamination that means either your the benchmark data or the test prompts of the benchmark data actually go inside your training data set that means it's going to have a massive increase in uh, how the data set is how the model is performing on that particular benchmark which is something that we have seen uh, in a lot of models. But the downside is like another interesting aspect of this paper, the downside is what they're saying is that when you're actually leaking the data, either intentionally, unintentionally, when the model is being trained on benchmark leak data, the model is not necessarily learning new knowledge, rather it is learning how to cheat the examination. It's like a student who knows only that 100 questions to cheat the examination, who would ultimately not have gained enough knowledge. The same way, this table actually tells you that when there is no data leakage, the model scored, let's say 45.40 on a different benchmark. But when there is data leakage, when the model has been trained on data leakage, the model actually does bad. It's worse than what it was before on other benchmarks. So not only that you are making the model, you know, miscommunicate to the entire world that the model is good at certain benchmarks, the model is actually inherently becoming bad at certain benchmarks, which is what this particular section talks about. This is the GPT Neo on um, the instruction tuning with Alpaca and Code Alpaca for a text and uh, it's text and code generation. Now this is all fine. So if you see what they are ultimately saying, like what are the suggestions they have got? These are the suggestions they have got. One, consider the potential risks associated with benchmark leakage. Like generally, you should be always aware of it, and you should uh, try to mitigate that. Okay, in addition to evaluating the advanced capabilities of LLMs, it is also necessary to perform evaluations on other data sets that focuses on basic abilities like text generation. So one, you should always consider the ris risk that this might be happening. And the second is you should have like wide range of evaluations than existing set of benchmarks. For LLM developers, what are the things? Perform strict checking on data contamination in the pre-training data. You know what data you are going to pre-train the model with you should make it a point to do the data contamination check. I don't know how many of you here are familiar with Kaggle, Kaggle competitions, especially the private board and public board, the leaderboard co concept. So Kaggle also have uh, got this problem like uh, for a lot of competitions, somebody would straight up shoot up to like the first position because they would have identified the data leakage. And uh, competition setters usually find it hard to keep a competition without a data leakage. It's, it's, it's a mistake on their part. But the point here is that if you are designing that LLM, like here in this case, you should know what is your pre-training data and you should make sure that it does not have contamination. So you should do data decontamination, make sure to avoid that there is any evaluation data being included in the training. In fact, they are suggesting that you can use uh, something like an n-gram hash algorithm to understand the overlap between pre-training data and the evaluation data to make sure that it doesn't have um, any contamination or leakage. And if possible, we suggest also excluding training data of mainstream evaluation benchmarks from pre-training data. Indicate any potential risk of data contamination or report, that is the most important thing, report the contamination analysis. I think that's something not you don't see in any model cards or any benchmark results, but something that people should start doing it and uh, report a more detailed composition of pre-training data. I, I guess like some people actually started doing it to like, where is it? For example, deep sea code or something we saw. Oh, sorry, we know that, okay, some 80-ish percent is code, some 10-ish uh, percent is Engl language, English, and uh, some 3 percent is like Chinese. So we saw all those things. It's not very extensive, but at least some people started doing it. The suggestions for benchmark maintainers. Provide the detail of data source for constructing the benchmark, conduct the contamination analysis. So they're saying, 
if you're somebody who manages this benchmark like MMLU, Hellaswag or um, a human eval, then you should actively go against the existing data set and then do this comparison. I don't, I don't think like a lot of people would do it. Like it's a big pain uh, given that they've already have this benchmark data set. But that's where I guess like the open source community are kind of, you know, having like an automated script to check. Okay, now I know if the pile is a very popular data set, a lot of people use the stack is a very popular data set. Now I can take the existing benchmark data set from, you know, let, let's say DS1000, which is a data science specific evaluation uh, benchmark. And I can go ahead and then check, okay, DS1000 is data science specific and how many of those questions or how many of those prompts are present in one of these data sets. So I think that's quite easier for the community to do rather than the benchmark maintainers to do. And also they are suggesting like having like a diverse set of prompts and all these things. I think in uh, conclusion, like, like I said, like this paper could have been a blog post. This is definitely, you know, this could have been like an email case, but I'm happy that people are talking about it and people are making, creating awareness about it. And that's exactly the point of this video where there is a risk of benchmark leakage. There is a dis risk of data contamination that ultimately makes these large language models a benchmark cheater, which you don't want to happen because I mean, if you want to feel good on your Twitter or a LinkedIn post saying that we have made a model that beats all the benchmarks, then it is fine. But if you actually want to build a robust, high quality, very good reasoning, large language model, then you shouldn't have a benchmark cheater and uh, probably follow the steps that are mentioned on this paper. See you in another video. Happy prompting.